said in one of our uh, educators' classrooms, but we're hosting it here because the empty belly food is what we can tell. The first in Edmonton to dedicate all of our coffee to birth friendly coffee. So 75% of the world's coffee is actually um, grown with herbicides and pesticides, and many native plants are removed when coffee is grown. Bird friendly coffee works with this, uh, supported by the same token, who works with both farmers to ensure canopy, natural canopy cover, and the coffee is grown in the shade. And what that helps is when all of our migrant birds head down south for the winter, they have habitat to actually thrive in, in addition to the coffee. So in an area where a normal coffee growing might have maybe 60 native birds that can survive there. But in areas where there are bird friendly coffee growing, close to 300 species of birds have habitats to survive. And those are the birds we share our summers with. And so thank you for coming to the cafe. Um, I am, before I introduce our awesome speaker today, I am going to, I'd like to acknowledge and give thanks to the land on which we're gathering uh, and to the people who cared for it since humans first came to this area, including the Cree, the Nanny, South Crow, Blackfoot, and the Norris. I would also like to acknowledge that we are on the Six territory and the home traditional nation of Um People and our non-human relatives have lived in this area, this what she was guiding, for 12,000 years. Um, it's diverse in landscapes that the river valley is in. It's called the Central Park. And that's a natural subregion that's unique to North America. And the Empty Valley is going to be openly soon found in this natural subregion. And it's an area where uh, animals have to live to learn to live on the edge. So snow our links are here at their southern edge. Um, so we're in a very biodiverse area. Yep, it is on two migratory flights. And so our river valley, which we're about to celebrate today, is an amazing place. And our tour guide for tonight is uh, Major Nick, otherwise known as Nick Tarter. And he is a writer, a photographer, and a naturalist based here out of Edmonton, but I know he works further abroad. He's a lifelong uh, love of nature that has led him to complete a bachelor of science training in the University of Alberta and really explore on his own our amazing river valley. Nick's experience in science and nature and perfect guidance include educational goals at Tennant Thomas World of Science, the John Jansen Nature Center, the New Park Conservatory, the Port of Jake Jury Dinosaur Museum and the Canadian Wildlife Federation for whom we partnered with tonight on the Shoreline Museum. So Nick has also worked as an ornithologist at the Royal Alberta Museum and is currently the Nature Kids Coordinator for the Nature Alberta. So we are going to get a tour of the River Valley by one of our local experts. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, great starting out. Great to see some people I haven't seen for quite a while. Um, yeah, so the River Valley. Uh, here's where we are. Um, we're just on the edge of the North Saskatchewan River. I mean, physically, right now. Uh, but that's the river that we're talking about tonight. Uh, so this river drains eastward from Saskatchewan Glacier. So the water that you drive over on your way here presumably if you don't live on, you know, the, the different side of the river, um, originates at Saskatchewan Glacier in Banff National Park, and it crosses all of Alberta before it merges with the South Saskatchewan River east of Prince Albert. Now, the uh, river here has a, an important history um, historically with people. It has acted as a natural boundary between the Cree who lived uh, sort of more in the northern forest area, and Blackfoot who live in the more southern plains, so it's kind of uh, historically bisected the province north to south. Uh, also a very important um, trading highway for the Hudson's Bay, uh, which is why Edmonton is where it is now, and the rest is human history, which we're not really here for. Um, and we'll see if I can keep on time for here. So uh, the North Saskatchewan River flows northeast through the city in this area. It uh, moves through a very wide, flat-bottomed valley. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting geological features, which we're kind of going to touch on a little bit before we get into the 
biodiversity. So the bedrock in uh, the Edmonton area and throughout a lot of the province is uh, composed of this formation called the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So this dates back to the late Cretaceous period. If you've ever been to uh, the that's a bad sign. If you've ever been to uh, the town of Trump Heller or the uh, sort of surrounding Badlands area, that's actually made up of the same type of rock uh, that we get around here. And this is just a, a, a Cretaceous rock exposure that's just out in the ravine uh, near where I live uh, on the south side. So you can find it all over the place. And so this was deposited in an environment of uh, rivers flowing from west to east over a low, flat, swampy floodplain, and we do get dinosaurs here, including the very uh, conveniently named Edmontosaurus. There's actually a bone bed of this species that you can find, um, well, other people have found it, uh, in the southwestern parts of the city along uh, the that river there. Uh, we also find evidence of its main predator, Albertosaurus, another conveniently named dinosaur. Most of what we find of this species here is its shed teeth because it was preying on Sources. So you skip a, a little bit ahead in time on top of that layer of Cretaceous bedrock uh, from about 60,000 to 25,000 years ago. Uh, there was all these uh, ancient rivers flowing across the province. They're not, they don't exist anymore, but we can find traces of them. Uh, through the Edmonton area, you had these, uh, this big river that created these valleys and it deposited sand and gravel. This is what we now call the Empress Formation. You can see large sort of chunky rock on top of the Cretaceous bedrock around here. That's where that comes from. Uh, after that happens, uh, you get the Ice Age. Uh, so this is during a time when the environment around here is very cold and very dry. It's kind of almost like a tundra and you get things, uh, well, let's see, um, during this time, the cooling and drying effect becomes all the more exaggerated until you have these giant glacial ice sheets covering the entire province. And it deposits uh, sandy mineral particles slowly as the ice melts away, as the climate starts to warm up again. And that's like the very top layer of the Edmonton global geology. So here's what was living around that time. If you've been to the Royal Alberta Museum, you'll recognize these displays, mammoths and uh, American lions. Bison were very abundant here, and this is actually um, not on the left, that's at the museum, but on the right there is just some little bits and pieces of bison that I've actually just found uh, down in Laurier Park, just around the bend from here. So uh, they were all over the place. That larger chunk up there is a bison tooth. So as this ice retreated northwards about 15,000 years ago, uh, meltwater pooled in the front of the receding glacier. And it created this giant lake that we call Glacial Lake Edmonton. Now, aside from the river valley, have you ever thought about how like flat the city of Edmonton is? It's not a city with a whole lot of hills once you sort of get up out of the valley. And that's because what we're driving around on all the time was once the bottom of this glacial lake. So while uh, all this sand and silt and clay was deposited at the bottom of this lake, and that's what the city is built on top of today. Now, uh, eventually, as you can see in this diagram, that ice retreated up to the poles, and uh, the meltwater from that draining lake carved out uh, this network of valleys, and that's what the North Saskatchewan flows through today. And as it kind of winded its way through, it created what we call terraces. So at these bends in the river, there's kind of like these shelves, and they tend to get a bit broader as you get further down into the valley. And they're popular places for um, building things like uh, country clubs, parks, golf courses, um, and zoos. That's where we're on right now. And what you get with this meandering river is these things called point bars. And essentially what's happening is the current is chewing away rock on the outside, well not really rock, but more like sediment on the outside of that bend and depositing it in the inside of the bend. So this curvy nature of the river becomes more and more exaggerated. Uh, so that's essentially why it looks like what it is today. And that's about the extent of my geology knowledge right here. Uh, so like mentioned earlier, we are in the central parkland 
natural region. So this is kind of a transitional zone. Uh, up in the north, you've got the massive boreal forest. It's a very cool, uh, relatively damp kind of place. And then south of us, all this yellow stuff is the grasslands, uh, which is a relatively warm and dry kind of place. And we're kind of in this zone where both these ecosystems are kind of overlapping and competing for dominance. Um, now, take a look at this here, only 5% of the native vegetation of the central parkland, you can see it right here, is remaining. And you know, a lot of the reason for that is there's a lot of people here and a lot of that native vegetation has been, you know, had towns and cities and farms built on top of it. So we gotta preserve what we have. Now as far as what grows here, uh, it is kind of a mixture of what you get up north versus what you get up south. Um, but the features change as you go sort of from up on prairie level down to uh, the bottom of the valleys. Up on the prairie level, you'll get uh, things like a trembling aspen really tends to dominate. If you look like right out the window, there's some trembling aspen for us. Uh, the further down you go, though, you get species that prefer lower, wetter areas. Uh, one of the more common things is the balsam poplar. This is a balsam poplar right here. Uh, you'll just have to trust me on that. Uh, and then to use some uh, sort of generalist stuff, like this white spruce here, which kind of grows everywhere. Uh, balsam poplar doesn't really have much resistance to, resistance to things like fire. So uh, its way of sort of avoiding not being burned, because it's not like a logical pine needing to be burned, it just grows in kind of wet areas that aren't really going to catch fire all that often, at least we hope. Um, some of the more characteristic trees and shrubs. Um, these can be, you know, a lot of these are pretty recognizable. They grow yay high and grow berries. Uh, general rule of thumb though, if something has white berries, uh, I don't recommend it. That's uh, red osier dogwood. Um, every Alberta interpreter has you know, made this joke a million times of how do you tell it's dogwood because of the bark. That's right. Um, those little white berries are pretty gross, but they won't kill you, at least in the quantities I've had them in. Uh, and then you get things like chip cherry, pink cherry. Um, smaller than that, things like mosses, low-growing species make up the forest floor. Um, you've also got things like the prickly rose in Saskatoon, which we are all very familiar with. Um, I'm obviously not too much of a plant person, so we're not going to dwell all that much on that. But here's kind of a problem that we're facing in uh, kind of across the province, but uh, in the Edmonton area, a lot of things like ornamental plants, like this European mountain ash, and then uh, weeds were either intentionally or unintentionally introduced to the area, and they just kind of exploded, uh, and they're all over the place. So things like thistles, even though it's called the Canada thistle, it's not from Canada, and uh, you know, nobody likes thistles, um, and they're really just kind of starting to take over. So there are very dedicated people who spend a whole lot of time trying to remove this stuff, but uh, you know, they grow like weeds. Uh, fungi, uh, I know even less about fungi than I do about plants, but the you other know, fungi are kind of interesting. A lot of people think that because they just kind of go in one place and they don't seem to move around, that they're kind of more or less the same thing as plants, but they're actually not. They are their sort of own kingdom in the uh, living thing family tree. Um, they don't photosynthesize like plants do, they actually consume dead stuff, and in a lot of ecosystems, fungi are the primary decomposers. So even though we might think that they're kind of gross or weird, uh, you know, we'd be up to our necks in rotting vegetation and uh, all sorts of other unpleasant stuff without them. Uh, so some fungi that you can find in the area if you're interested in such things, and there's actually entire clubs dedicated to this in the Alberta Mycological Society, so they'll tell you everything you want to know about fungi. Uh, things from slime molds to lichens, so that crusty stuff that grows on tree bark or like that hangs down from the branches. That's not a moss, that's a lichen, and a lichen is a symbiotic organism. It's a fungus with an algae kind of growing amongst it. 
And then you get things like uh, your mushrooms and your bracket fungus. Um, so that's pretty noticeable. Most funguses exist as tiny little microscopic things that just float through the air so you can't see them. So they're not the most watchable things. So now we're getting into things that move, which are a little bit more uh, my speciality. And we're going to start with bugs. Um, I'm going to guess that probably about half the people here don't really care all that much for bugs. And your first instinct when you see one is to run away from it or smack it or something. Uh, but there are thousands of uh, you know, species out there. Uh, we don't have the diversity that you get in tropical places, but yeah, that's quite a lot. By the way, by bugs, I mean any kind of like invertebrate that has like limbs and an exoskeleton. So entomologists use bug in a very technical way. I'm using it in a very informal way. So insects, spiders, um, which are in the arachnid group. Uh, our crustaceans that you get around here range from little side swimmer scuds that live in ponds and in the river, all the way up to uh, invasive crayfish, which actually can be found in the creek. Myriapods, these are your centipedes and your millipedes. Um, I don't know how those things are kind of me out. Um, now, these kinds of things aren't really for everybody, but a lot of bugs are really cool and I think can definitely be categorized as watchable wildlife, which we're you know, going to talk about. If you're interested in starting with uh, getting into bugs, and I do recommend taking the dive because it's very rewarding, uh, kind of the, the easy sort of push, first push into that is to get into butterflies, at least that's how it was for me. So butterflies are really just a type of moth. They're a particular kind of moth that comes out during the day, and not all of them are brightly colored, but a lot of them are. Uh, if you want to tell a butterfly from a non-butterfly moth, look at the antennae. Butterflies have these little clubs, typically on the ends of their antennae. Uh, in moths, they tend to be um, like fuzzy or just kind of tapered at the tip. Most of these things are pollinators feeding on flower nectar, but they'll even eat tree sap or mud or even uh, animal droppings. Do you know that? Um, most of these things spend their entire lives uh, in Alberta. There are a few species that actually migrate from further south. Uh, some are kind of short distance migrants. Some can fly pretty amazing distances, like the monarch, for example. Well, I've never seen a monarch around here. I've always wanted to know. And they, they, they spend the winter here in a variety of different forms, some overwinter as little eggs, or as caterpillars that just sleep all through the, the cold time, uh, or as a, a pupae. Um, but some things will actually just kind of rest in, you know, under the leaf litter, or in a crooked some bark, or even inside people's houses, and they'll just kind of spend the winter uh, as adults, and uh, one of the best examples, if you're going to learn any butterfly in Alberta, start with the morning cloak. So this is a species that uh, hibernates through our winter as adults, and if you get like a really warm day in the middle of winter, uh, these things will actually sort of think it's spring and they'll come out. So you can see uh, things like morning cloaks theoretically any time of the year. Uh, now for butterflies, there's only five major families that you have to contend with. There are quite a few species but there's just about as many species of butterflies here as there are birds. So it's not um, you know, super intimidating. Our butterfly families range from these little things called skippers. Uh, this species is actually only about that big, so you've got to look really close. Uh, on the other end of the size spectrum is things like the swallowtails. And these are all things that I've just found like, you know, down along the river, so you don't have to look too hard for them. Uh, another small group is the, uh, the lichenids, this is a silvery blue. Uh, this one here, the clouded sulfur, which is in the sulfur's white family. You can see it pretty much any warm day. Uh, these things will be out from kind of mid-spring up until, um, even into early fall, up until it starts to get consistently cold. And then this butterfly is very sort of characteristic of summer, it's a white admiral. Um, and it's really hard to mistake for anything else you get around here. So if you see a big black butterfly with these white bands, blue and red spots, you know it's a white animal. 
And then you can get into other cool stuff. Um, you know, for every big interesting bug, there's like a million that are really tiny and impossible to identify unless you're into that sort of deal. Uh, but there's some other cool stuff. This is one of my favorite types of beetles. This is a bronze tiger beetle. And if you went out to the riverbank down near the uh, boat launch, um, just down at Laurier Park, you probably see a whole bunch of these crawling around. They like sandy and clay areas. That's where I saw this one. Uh, they come out on hot days, and they're really vicious little predators. They're really interesting to watch. Uh, this is a type of wasp. Um, who here is just like absolutely sick of the wasps right now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so those are your, your paper wasps, your hornets, yellow jackets, that kind of thing. This type of wasp can't actually hurt you, uh, even though it looks really scary and intimidating. It's a thread-wasted wasp. And what it's got here, it's got some kind of little insect larvae. Now their stinger can't like penetrate the skin of a person, but what it does is it strategically stings these little nerve bundles inside these larvae, so it keeps them alive but it paralyzes them. And it lays its eggs on these larvae, and then the, the baby wasps hatch on it and just kind of eat it. Um, so that's you know a built-in food system, which is pretty, you know, I wouldn't want to be that larva. Um, good thing I'm not. And then you get into dragonflies. Uh, this is uh, a pretty big and theatrical one. It's also easy to identify the four spotted skimmer. It's got this kind of stubby, flat abdomen on it. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight spots on the four spotted skimmer. So never take animal names that seriously. Uh, and then things like spiders. I don't really get people that are afraid of I mean, I get people who are afraid of like tarantulas and big things, but some spiders, like this jumping spider that I found down by the river, they're, you know, look at it, it's just kind of cute. It's, it's just a little tiny gray thing, and they can jump, like, amazingly, like little grasshoppers. It's really cool. And then you get uh, things like crab spiders. So these things live in flowers, you'll especially find them in roses, kind of late spring, early summer. And what they do is they just kind of sit there and they wait for a pollinating insect to come to them. And then they just kind of nab it. And uh, I've actually seen them like um, sort of stow their prey. They don't make a big web that they just kind of let things hang out in. They will actually just kind of like um, tie their, their prey that they pop up into a little leaf in a little bundle and then just kind of leave them later. Uh, so, you know, spiders come in all sorts of lifestyles and appearances and things. Uh, now we get into fish. There are just over 20 species that are known to inhabit the North Saskatchewan and the creeks that flow into it. Uh, unless you're an angler, fish are not exactly the easiest things to watch, but you, know, you can catch a glimpse of them as you go, you know, over the creek or something like that. Uh, and you know they, they range in size, so you'll get things like the northern pike. This is a, a museum pike, so I didn't actually like go to that in the fun. Uh, this is a fathead minnow, and you see these like lumps on its face right here. Those are called nuptial tubules, and that's what they will like. The males will like apparently kind of wrestle with each other with those things. They only grow them during the breeding season. So fish do a lot of weird stuff that. Unless you're really looking for it, we don't often see. Uh, here's all the types of fish that you could stand a chance of seeing in the uh, river. We're not going to go through all of them because you know, most of them are just little really minnows and things like that. But we'll get some kind of big things like perch and saugers and uh, moon eyes, golden eyes, even sturgeons. Pretty rare nowadays, but they're, they're around. Uh, now we get into amphibians. A lot of people just think that these are kind of the same thing as reptiles, but they're actually uh, very different types of things. Reptiles, in a lot of ways, have more in common with us than they do with things like salamanders and frogs and stuff. So these things are, here's your biology term for the day, anamniotic. I think it's kind of an old dusty term. But basically, it's a word for animals that don't lay an egg that has lots of like 
membranous layers, usually in a shell or in the case of most mammals, uh, held within the uterus. Um, they just kind of lay their eggs in the water in kind of a jelly type substance like uh, fish do. And they go through an aquatic larval stage and then uh, either a semi-aquatic or sometimes even like fully terrestrial adult stage. Uh, the skin on these things is very soft and slimy and it's very glandular. Um, now what that means is, you know, a lot of people when they see something like a tiger salamander or a wood frog, which are kind of your two more common things to see around here, a lot of people think they're cool and they want to pick them up. But think about all the crap that you have on your hands just from being out and about. Um, if you've been outside, uh, you know, touching all sorts of stuff, uh, would you want to just like pop your hand in your mouth and leave it there for a while? You probably found it pretty gross, but that's a little bit like um, how an amphibian feels when you hold it. Their skin is very uh, sort of permeable, it absorbs a lot of chemicals, and if you've got the wrong kind of chemicals on your skin, um, you know, that can cause them some harm. So always best to do it with uh, clean hands if you have to hold them at all. Uh, during this time of year, tiger salamanders are actually starting to look for a place to spend the winter. And oftentimes that means uh, people's basements or garages, things like that, because it's, you know, it's a cool, dark place. Uh, it's a place that they feel kind of safe. Normally they're hibernating in burrows, uh, under leaves, things like that. Uh, if they get into our dwellings, you know, some of you might not mind a salamander roommate, but uh, it'll dry out pretty quickly in our uh, winter conditions here. Uh, my brother actually found one of the jobs I just the other day. Um, I encouraged him to put it in a safe place. I hope he did. Um, I didn't see it happen. I'm not sure it uh, but that's our amphibians. We don't have too many around here, so they're, they're easy to learn. Um, you know, wood frogs, you can best find them in uh, uh, the wetlands on these riverside terraces. Uh, go down to the nature center, places like that, they'll be around there. And they're fun to watch. And uh, our, our reptile diversity around here is even lower. Uh, we basically reliably, in the Edmonton area, have like one common sink. And I've seen several individuals of this snake species, the red-sided garter snake, this summer. But they're so darn fast. The second I pull my camera out, they're just in through the, the leaves and they're gone. Um, I'm guessing probably a lot of people here don't really love the idea of snakes. Um, but if this snake is completely harmless to us. Uh, they don't grow very big, and they eat things that we find unpleasant, like worms and, uh, you know, other kind of slimy invertebrates that they find on the ground or little fish. So, uh, yeah, snakes, unlike amphibians, are not uh, slimy. They have a dry, scaly skin. They're, the, the scales on their skin are made out of the same stuff as your fingernails, so they're, um, you know, they've got something in common with us. They uh, produce amniotic eggs. Uh, just like we do, we do some like shell like they do. Uh, and then uh, these snakes, they'll actually get together in these groups and uh, they'll, they'll go underground together in these little burrows that we call hypermacula, just a place for them to shelter for the winter together. So they are sort of forced to get along pretty well with each other during that time. Uh, anybody who knows me won't be too surprised that we're spending most of our, well, maybe not most of our time, but a good chunk of our time here on birds. There's lots of birds to find around here. And birds are nothing more or less than just a particular kind of dinosaur. Uh, by the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous period, there was all sorts of different lineages of little feathery, flappy, snippy dinosaurs running around. And all of them ended up dying except one particular lineage that survived and continued to thrive, and we call them birds. So birds are a warm-blooded type of dinosaur with feathers, and uh, you can see some of the, the similarities in the skeleton. This is a, a magpie that I put together for the Royal Alberta Museum. Um, you know, I think it's just the grand centerpiece of the entire uh, place. So you might disagree. Um, I don't know why they kind of tucked it in a little corner, but uh, there you go. This is a Dromaeosaurus at the Royal Turtle Museum. Um, now, birds are, are really interesting. They 
uh, exhibit, you know, strong parental care. They're very intelligent. They have very complicated social behaviors. Um, a lot of our local species migrate to or from the area seasonally, uh, but well, quite a few stick around. Uh, starting with the waterfowl, ducks, and geese, um, you probably, you know, would rightly assume that most of these are going to be migrating away for the, uh, the winter. But what's interesting about the Saskatchewan, and it's partly our fault, uh, a lot of spots along the river don't freeze over. And so where open water persists, a lot of these things, like the you know, common golden eye ducks, for example, community geese, they'll actually spend the entire winter. If you go on online, you know, local birding forums, Facebook pages, things like that, there's always somebody who sees or hears Canada geese in like mid-January. And they're going, oh my god, the geese are back early, what's going on? Those geese never left. They've been here the whole time. Uh, you just have to kind of look for them. Uh, down in uh, the river, you're not going to get a whole lot of waterfowl diversity because most of them are out on the lakes and the wetlands, uh, you know, up on the, the uplands, things like that. Uh, but you'll get little you know, ducks like buffleheads, which are really cute. They like little uh, ponds and creeks. And this is a very sort of forest, river, stream specialist duck here, the common organser. That's what the male looks like. They've got these weird serrated hook bills, so they're, they're definitely fish catching specialists. Uh, and this is a female with some big neighbor dancers that I saw uh, down in Whitman Park earlier this summer. You'll get to your uh, shorebirds. Uh, so these are wading birds. Again, most of these prefer sort of upland, wetland environments. But the spotted sandpiper here uh, particularly likes uh, river and creek sides where it sort of probes for food. Uh, you can see this one's not spotted. That's because I photographed it in uh, late summer, early fall when it was in its non breeding plumage. But you can always tell a spotted sandpiper because whenever they're doing anything, their tail is going up and down like that. So just watch for a little long legged shorebird that's, you know, big one its butt up and down. <laughs> Getting into the gulls, oh, again, a lot of people don't really pay all that much attention to gulls unless they're trying to. You know, steal your fries or something. But you know, there's there's a few different species, and they're they're pretty cool in their own right. Um, you've got your herring gulls, which breed uh, you know, pretty far to the northeast. They pass through our area in uh, the spring and the fall, and they gather in rivers and things like that. You've got your ring-billed gull that spend the entire uh, spring through fall here. They mostly gather in parking lots. Um, they're interesting. These are California gulls. I think there's maybe one herring gull in there, but that doesn't really matter. Um, so there's, there's you know, several different species. Um, I haven't included everything because you'd be here all night and probably already you know, maybe crank for time. Um, other kinds of water loving birds, you've got your cormorants, your pelicans. Uh, these are uh, you know, fish eating birds. They tend to prefer like larger lakes, but I've seen them down. Uh, in the river, hanging out there as well. Your uh, birds of prey, these are both things that also eat a lot of fish. Uh, typically it's the osprey that's actually doing a great job of catching them, and then the bald eagle comes along and steals them. Uh, major difference between these, though, is the ospreys uh, typically migrate south for the winter, whereas bald eagles, in small numbers, will actually hang around all winter. Uh, particularly if it's kind of a mild year with a lot of open water, because they're either catching fish or they're catching uh, the ducks that hang out. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, but they are definitely pirates. You'll often see them, especially in uh, kind of you know, harsher times, just stealing a lot of food from other birds of prey. As far as hawks go, they find two main varieties. There's your occipiter hawks, so these are woodland hawks. Um, this is one of the more common examples, it's a Cooper's hawk, and you compare it to the, I never learned how to pronounce this, but I heard people say Buteo, 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 I've never heard it said out loud. I'm always the person who just has to say it, and I don't know if it's correct. somebody tell me later. Uh, these are your soaring hawks, so this is a broad wing hawk. Uh, we typically think of the soaring hawks as being like open grassland prairie things, but things like the broad wing live in forests. I saw like three down in the river valley at different this year. You'll see the, the Coopers has these kind of 
shorter, rounder wings and really long tail. It's very long and streamlined. Whereas the broad wing has these big, long wings, kind of a short tail. So these have very different hunting strategies. One's kind of zipping through the forest and catching songbirds. The other's kind of circling around on updrafts, mostly looking for you know, rodents, that kind of thing. And speaking of rodents, one of their worst nightmares is the owl. Uh, the River Valley is very well known among bird watchers as the place to go for owls. And there is uh, three main species that you can, you know, if you work hard enough and you know where to go, you can count on seeing. Uh, there's the northern sawback owl, which is a very small owl. As you can see, they like to live in tree cavities, things like that. So this is a great reason for why we should keep things like old um, dead trees, what we call snags. Um, and they are because these things need to live in them. Uh, you've got the barred owl, which is kind of a medium large ish owl, and then our big one is the great horn. So these things are around all winter, and they're a very specialized kind of bird. Uh, you can see the face on them is kind of flat, the eyes face forward, so they're very visually oriented birds. They've also got uh, really exceptional hearing, and the rain feathers. It's kind of interesting. The first few flight feathers on the wings have these um, specially adapted, what we call barbs, on the feather, little tufts that come off the feather. And so when the wings flap, you don't hear it. So uh, everything about them is really well adapted for hunting at night and not being seen or heard. And like I said, they're around all year. The best time to see owls in uh, the Edmonton River Valley, though, is late winter to early spring. That's when they're at the most active. They're starting to mate, to lay their eggs, and they're you know, working around the clock to gather food for each other, for the young. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, don't join the owl paparazzi. <laughs> you go up to where owls are, and there's those people who are camped out there the entire day, and they're just snapping photos away. Uh, now, consider how you'd like it if on your front lawn there was a handful of people just sitting there all day long. Every time you looked out the window, they're snapping photos of you, and they were all more interested in you when you started eating or you know wanting to procreate, that kind of thing. Would you feel very comfortable? Probably not. Imagine how the owls feel. I always try to limit my time with the owls when I see them to short uh, bursts. But uh, you know, when, when they feel comfortable, they'll give you some good looks. These are a pair of great horned owls down in uh, White Mud Park. I visited them uh, pretty frequently over the winter, and the, uh, both the male and the female spent a lot of time just perching out in the open, nosing in the sunshine. And um, oftentimes, great horned owls will build like proper nests, but these ones actually favor this old hole in this great big false poplar tree. And they've been using it off and on for several years, so it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, moving on to slightly less exciting things, unless you're a real bird nerd. Uh, we've got kingfishers, well, we've got the kingfisher around here, one species, the belted kingfisher. Um, it does what the name says, they eat fish. Uh, I don't know if they're in some barn, but you know. Um, and they, they make their nests in holes along uh, sandy riverbanks and things like that. Um, River Valley is full of woodpeckers. Uh, most of these live here year-round, and they're pretty much all insect eaters, uh, also things that really rely on old dead trees. And the holes that they make in them, other species won't move into. I've kind of grouped them into three main categories based off of how they go about getting their food. Um, but not all of these things are each other's closest relative. But you've got things like the downy and the hairy and the pileated woodpecker that sort of chisel straight into the bark. And even though these things look completely identical at first glance, if you're not like a bird uh, aficionado, they are two different species. And learning the difference is you know, kind of one of the early challenges. For bird watching, you've got things that flick the bark off to the side. Uh, the three toed and black back woodpeckers do that. I didn't show a black back here because they look very similar to this one. Um, they are here in theory, but they're a very kind of shy woodpecker. Um, I've seen evidence of them down in the River Valley, but I haven't actually seen uh, a three toed or a black back woodpecker in the Edmonton area for many years. 
Uh, you'll get things like when they like to eat ants, like the northern flicker. Um, they look completely different from any other kind of woodpecker around here. I uh, can see the males have this black mustache here. And then you've got the yellow bellied sapsucker, which drills into living trees and makes little rows of holes. So if you see like little sort of rows in a sort of usually like square shape on a, a tree, that's what caused that. The sap oozes out, and you know, they'll eat the sap, but what they're really going after is the bugs that come to eat the sap, and then you know they get some protein and sugar at the same time. Uh, falcons. Uh, a lot of people sort of assume that hawks and falcons are the same thing, but they're actually not related at all. Uh, the falcons are another kind of fast-flying bird of prey. Our common falcon is kind of a smallish species called the merlin. Uh, they're also found here year-round. They hunt in forests, things like that. Um, other sort of open country things like kestrel, prairie falcon, peregrine have been found in the Edmonton River Valley before. Um, but you know, don't hold your breath looking for one. And we'll even sometimes get this really, really big falcon that comes down from the Arctic to winter here, uh, the jeer falcon. They used to be really common at the grain terminal, uh, just off the Yellowhead, uh, for many years, but they haven't been seen for a few years now, which I'm going to try to figure out why. Uh, we're just kind of going to rip through the songbirds really quick because there's so many of these things. Uh, but here's some of the more common species are Eastern Phoebe. Um, not a very flashy songbird, uh, but it, it says its name, Rose Phoebe. Um, that's what we call it that. And uh, what they also do is when they're perched, the, the tail kind of pops up and down like that. A little bit like the spotted sandhog. Don't know why it does that. Maybe something to the Phoebe's. Uh, you'll get your vireos, the red eye vireo is more common of these two that uh, I've you know, seen down here before. Uh, vireos are a pain in the butt though, they're really common. Um, but they sit right up at the top of like the tallest trees amidst all of the leaves up there. And you know, they're really small, but they're really loud so you can hear them. But you really gotta work hard to see them. Uh, you've got your corvids, your crows, ravens, jays, things like that. Uh, the blue jay is a really common thing around here, but it's relatively recently common. Uh, the blue jay has historically been kind of more of an eastern thing, but as people brought you know, farming and bird feeders and suburbs westward, um, the blue jay kind of came with them. It's not like they were you know, not here at all, just not in the numbers of yet. Uh, a lot of people wonder what the difference is between crows and ravens. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures I ever got because you can compare them in the same picture. I've never got them in the same frame before, but you can see that the crow or the raven has these sort of big crooked wings, really large bill, uh, and this sort of diamond shaped tail. Crow, medium size, wings, you can't really see the bill, and then it's got a very square tipped tail to it. Um, you know, you've also got the magpie. Everybody knows the magpie. If you don't know what it looks like, look outside. <laughs> so we'll let more you. Um, yeah. You know, somebody once I was talking to somebody at a bird watching event, and they asked me what the city of Edmonton was doing about magpies, and uh, I was like, well, I don't think they're, they're doing anything. Like, why don't they keep track of population magpies? And she's like. Well, they're not even from here. Like, they should be just like the other invasive species. And I was like, no, they're not. And that kind of shows our relationship and the way we think about things that we don't really like. And it's kind of weird that magpies, you know, they're intelligent, they're kind of tough, they're really stubborn. They're a lot like us in a way. And I guess we don't really like the competition. But, um, you know, who are we? Especially, uh, presumably, most of us here are, are descended from relatively recent settlers. Who are we to look at an animal that has been here for about two million years and tell it that it doesn't belong? Uh, you've got your small, little, round, fluffy things that eat seeds, uh, red breast and white breasted is not hatch. Uh, they're cool, they're easy to find, they don't usually kind of put on a show for you. Uh, kinglets. Um, Another thing that's easier to hear than they are to uh, to see. Very very small, but they're pretty, you know, they're charming little things. Uh, you've got your chickadees. Everybody knows the um, the black cap chickadee. Uh, this is one I like to I enjoy seeing when I can. It's the boreal chickadee, kind of the, just the brunette version of the chickadee. Uh, 
Um, for swallows, there's several different species of swallows, but the two more notable ones you're going to get down here are cliff swallows, which for the most part don't really nest on cliffs anymore because we started building bridges and they really like to nest underneath bridges. They'll actually make these little uh, mud nests that um, are kind of like upside down cup shape and they just fly right up into them. Uh, I think the, the Quinell Bridge over the river has like some that were nesting underneath it this summer. And then uh, again, just down in Laurier Park along the riverbank, uh, there's a big colony. I think they've all left for the season. They weren't there last time I was a couple weeks ago. Uh, are these bank swans? And they make these holes in sandy riverbanks like this, and you know that's where they they spend the summer. And they're really nice. Sorry. Do you know when they need them? No idea. I was there like two weeks ago, and I thought they'd still be there. So. Were they though? They weren't. Yes. I don't know. They they do what they want. Um, kind of some some odds and ends here. You've got uh, this this bird is not this big. It's actually about this big. It's a brown creeper. I have spent so many hours of my life looking for brown creepers, and it's it's a pretty it's a rewarding process. You feel really good when you find them. And they basically look like a little flat tree bark that just scurries up the tree and then zips over to the next tree. Their call is so high pitched that people over a certain age apparently can't hear them. Um, so take care of your ears if you want to see a brown creeper. Uh, and this is a cat bird. It doesn't look like a cat, but it sounds like a cat. The first time I ever heard one, I thought really was like, does it lose a cat down here? And then I go, it's a cat bird. So then I you know, found it. Uh, this one was just down. Uh, a couple months ago, I saw it down where the White Mud Creek drains into the river. So they are around, not for too much longer this year. Uh, you got your thrushes, uh, the American Robin, everybody knows it, everybody's familiar with it. Um, but there are some you know, rarer woodland thrushes that are kind of interesting. This is a Swainson's thrush. Uh, this I saw down in the McTaggart Sanctuary, I think it was in May of this year, um, a lot more cryptic, uh, but you can see it, it's kind of raw and shaped, like a raw color. The Townsend Solitaire, you know, it's a very long, sleek kind of thrush, and they actually live up in the mountains and they come out here to, uh, in the, the river valley to spend the winter. Uh, you've got your wax wings, the cedar wax wings are summer wax wing, and then uh, it leaves uh, around now, they're kind of early. Harbors. And then the Bohemian waxwing is our winter waxwing, and they'll be around for about you know, November into March. Uh, during the winter, we get just inundated with finches. Uh, you've got the purple finch, your pine siskin. Um, the, the siskins are around all year, so are purple finches, but they really become noticeable during the winter because they're working a lot harder for food. Uh, the common red pole is an Arctic finch that. Um, some years it's here, some years it's not. Uh, but usually when it's here, it's in really big numbers. Uh, your pine grosbeak is a pretty large, kind of chunky finch. Uh, you can see uh, the, the shape of the bill compared to the long, skinny one of the siskin. They're adapted for eating different kinds of seeds. And that adaptation gets really wild in the crossbills, the white wing, and the red, uh, where the two halves of the bill actually cross over like that. And that's really useful for prime open cones, seeds inside. You got your sparrows. Uh, these things are going to be, for the most part, leaving um, within the next uh, month or so. More so, like your chipping sparrows, play colored sparrows, uh, white crowned sparrows really uh, migrate through the area. You don't see them all that much during the summer, but um, spring and fall, you see a lot of them. Uh, but the white-throated sparrow and the dark-eyed junco, you go down to uh, like White Pud Park, for example, in the winter, and these are some of the more common songbirds that you'll be seeing. So uh, they're a tough little guy. You can see this white-throated sparrow. I think I photographed it in like January or February. Um, it doesn't look like it's enjoying the winter. <laughs> um, warblers. Uh, our warblers are leaving as we speak. Uh, this area is a particularly good spot to see warblers as they're coming down from the north and passing through. And they migrate pretty far. 
all the way down to the Caribbean. Uh, and there's, this is just like a small variety of them. These are some of the more like dense woodland kind of warblers. Um, some prefer on slightly more open habitats. Um, it takes a while to work them and they can be hard to find, but they're, you know, they're rewarding. Uh, second to last type of bird, uh, this is a, a western tanager. Uh, and they're really nice. Their, their song kind of sounds like a robin in a rush, uh, which is kind of interesting. But then you think, OK, that's not a robin, that's a tanager. And then you find them. They're very, very lovely. They're very somewhat large, you know, really sort of tropical colored songbird. And then in the area, you'll get some weird stuff that turns up from time to time. Uh, last, I think it was last October, we had an American Dipper show up in White Blood Park, and that's it. Uh, this is a, a bird that lives along fast flowing streams uh, in the mountains. It really doesn't live anywhere else but uh, in like Rocky Mountain environments. But what showed up here? So, so did all the bird watchers to see it. Um, Harlequin ducks have been reported in the river from time to time. Uh, there's even a record from uh, the early 90s. If you read uh, Birds of Alberta by Fisher and Apar, they tell the story of a yellow-billed loon that got trapped uh, in a, a small opening in the ice in the, the winter. And there's a nest in the water. Um, our last section is mammals. Uh, so these are things in pair. Uh, they produce milk, warm blooded. Um, yeah. So, for example, here this is a woodchuck. Uh, it's actually a type of squirrel. It's a ground squirrel. It's our biggest ground squirrel. And they like uh, kind of shrubby areas where they can, you know, sort of pop out and graze and then, you know, hide underground in their burrows. And uh, I think they tend to go into hibernation. Those are the early in the year, so you won't really too late to see them now. Uh, you've got your small things. Uh, some of this stuff I have seen myself, shrews, bats, that kind of thing. Uh, these are very diverse types of mammals, but good luck getting a photograph of one. Uh, yeah, but there are bats in the area. I think bats are pretty cool. Good for eating insects. Uh, our greatest mammal diversity is the rodents. Uh, so these are things with uh, specialized chewing incisors, and they make up almost half of mammal diversity. But they range in size from things like the uh, red bat, bull, least chipmunk, all the way up to your muskrats and your porcupines, all of which you can see around here. Uh, but definitely the most ubiquitous one is the American red squirrel. Um, you know, they'll they'll tell you if you're in their space and they don't want you to be there because they just want to scold you like crazy. Um, and you, if you can't see a red squirrel, you can see traces of them. So this here is an example of what's called a midden. So all this red stuff here is uh, spruce scales. So squirrels will just sit in one place and chew all of the, the seeds off of uh, spruce cones, and they just kind of fall on this pile. And uh, that's, that's sort of its winter stash. And then because squirrel people have to have a fancy name for everything, Squirrel's nest is not called a nest, it's called a dray. And this is a dray, it's just kind of a big soccer ball sized bundle of, you know, gunk in the trees, but that's where they spend the winter. Um, actually, well, they, they spend a lot of every night there. They, they don't sleep through the winter. Uh, we also have quite a few beavers around here. They, they're kind of more of like an evening early morning species, so you're going to have to you know, go out around that time to see them. But you can see lots of examples of their work. This is just down near my place. There is a lodge right here, and you can see it's constructed a dam. There's actually several more dams in all these different directions. So, you know, they're famous for being hard-working critters. Uh, Lagomorphs, rabbits and hares. Around here we only have hares. Hairs are just a hair that they can look at. Um, I've looked outside during this talk and seen one or two examples of this thing, the white-tailed jackrabbit. It's kind of like uh, a rabbit or a, a hair that's kind of trying to be a deer. It's got these long legs and big ears, and they're, they're grazers. Uh, this small kind of more bunny rabbit one, that's the snowshoe hair. Both of these things will change color during the winter, so in another couple months, They'll be all white, but it will be snow, and uh, yeah, they're around. Uh, getting in 
into the carnivores, not all of which are carnivorous. Uh, every now and then you get reports of things like black bears and cougars making their way through the river valley. And you know, it, it still is, and it always has been, a natural highway for large wildlife to go from you know west to east or in the opposite direction. You know, they feel kind of safer and more uh, comfortable passing through than you know wandering down the city streets. Um, so you can't blame them for that. Um, definitely not a common thing. So if you go for a walk in the river valley, you don't need to be looking over your shoulder for black bears or anything. But they are out there. Now and then. Uh, these things are out there too. Um, almost as hard to see, but uh, they're, they're pretty neat. That's a long-tailed weasel. So all sorts of what we call uh, the mustelids, weasels, minks, that kind of stuff live down here. And even though they're pretty small, they're pretty ferocious little predators. You've got your foxes, red fox. Now red foxes aren't actually as common today as they used to be uh, before we started making things like farms and suburbs around here. And it's because of, uh, it seems to be because of this, the coyote. This is one that I photographed on White Blood Creek a couple years ago. And it just kind of walked right up to me, gave me this look like, what the heck are you doing? And then it just turned around and walked away. We have very, as Albertans, mixed feelings about coyotes. I like coyotes, I think they're really interesting. You know, a lot of people just kind of have this attitude that the only good coyote is a dead coyote. And you know, I think that's a real shame. I can see why they think that. But you know, the coyote is kind of a, a product of our own, a problem of our own creation. Because people came out here, there was a lot of wolves, a lot of foxes, moderate amount of coyotes. We, uh, it's the ghost of the wolves. We killed all, you know, a lot of the wolves. Wolves kill coyotes. So not a lot of wolves. A lot of garbage, a lot of places to hide. Coyote population goes through the roof. Coyotes kill foxes. Um, so now we got a lot of coyotes, not a whole lot of much else as far as wild dogs go. Um, that is how it is. Uh, our last section is the even toed ungulates, the big grazing things. Um, we used to you know, have a lot of bison around here. Uh, the closest bison now are over in Elk Island. But historically, they occupied the river valley and the surrounding plains. You can find remnants of uh, you know, wild bison and you know, evidence that people were eating bison around here for thousands of years. Uh, we got here two species of deer, the white-tailed deer. Um, this is a museum mount. I've never been able to get a great photo of a, you know, a white-tailed buck. Um, but you can see the difference in the antlers between the white tail, which tends to live more in like forested environments. So they are really common, you just don't tend to see them quite as much as the mule deer, which is a bit less skittish. And um, you can tell the mule deer because the antlers branch into sort of pairs um, as the branching goes, instead of a single beam with these kinds coming off. Also, the mule, I'm glad I captured this. Stick its tail up. It's got a stubby little black tipped tail. Looks like it was dipped in paint. And uh, yeah, more something more of an open country kind of deer. We get moose around here as well. There was actually a young bull moose hanging out in White Mud Park this summer. Um, and they like kind of low, wet, shrubby areas where they can, you know, feed on willows, and water plants, that kind of stuff. Um, it's hard to mistake a moose for anything else. Um, if a moose ever gives you this look. That's when it's time to run. I took that from a tour bus in Jasper. So uh, if you're on foot, it's a whole different story. This is typically how we tend to see moose, though, just kind of peeking through the vegetation. And I'm uh, pretty much on track, which is great. Um, so I'll leave off with uh, putting this all together and then the final message for the evening. So the River Valley in Edmonton is both important as a hub for urban biodiversity, which is a very interesting thing to people like me, and it's a popular recreation spot for Edmontonians. Now, these things are sometimes at odds. Um, our activities tend to impact biodiversity and vice versa, but they don't need to be. Um, we've done a comparatively decent job of keeping uh, the river valley green and clean, 
Um, but it's not something that we can afford to take for granted because uh, you know, I think we all miss it if it wasn't there anymore. Um, as Edmonton, you know, we, we have to cherish what we've got. We've got Calgary, which is so spoiled with the mountains at the back door, and then you just look up the window and admire them and pop off to Rand for Kananaskis whenever they want. We've got to cherish what we've got, and this is what we've got. So this place has been a home to many sensitive species as well as people for a long, long time. And you know, we're just kind of passing through. So when you're out in about the nature, keep that in mind and try to think and act accordingly. Uh, and that's where I will end it. So thank you all for coming out. Thank you to the zoo and the development society for having me. Uh, it was a great honor to be here and give this talk. And if anybody has questions, I will be happy. So, um, I live near the mud art, and there's three beavers that have been hanging out, and I see them in the North Saskatchewan sometimes. But I wonder, like, where would they actually be spending the night? Because would you put a lodge on the side of that giant river, or would it be more like on the side of the river? Oh, yeah. If you go to the, the boat launch down in Laurier, yeah. uh, look right. There's a lodge just right along the river there. Um, yeah, we'll do it. They'll, they'll make a home wherever they feel like they see it. Thank you. Anyways, yeah. Have uh, wild dogs arrived here yet? Uh, yes. I mean, they're pretty much, uh, so for those who can't hear the question is, are there uh, like wild boar in the area? Um, the answer is yes. More so in rural areas outside of the city, and I think the problem around the like, hills. West of the city, kind of south of the Spruce Grove, South Plain, and then beyond. Um, I haven't heard of them being in the city. Um, it could just be a matter of time before they're sneaking around here. I hope they don't show up because they're pretty destructive. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. Could you give some background on your camera and how much you were introduced to get these beautiful photographs? Um, well, as my wife can tell you, I, I spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> working away at this. Some days with no results whatsoever. Um, then, you know, wildlife photography and, and bird watching kind of go hand in hand. Is, it's a little bit like fishing. You gotta spend a, a decent to a lot of money and a lot of time outside. And sometimes you come home with a great story to tell and great results. And a lot of the time you come home uh, with nothing to show for it. But that's how it goes. So I use just kind of like used equipment that I just kind of bought second hand. So it's second hand DSLR battery. I, I shoot Nikon, not because I think it's any better than Canon. You know, those people will own this already. I don't care. I really don't care about the, the brand loyalty. Um, that's just what was available to me. And then I bought a, a second hand big zoom telephoto lens. It's a one. 500 millimeter, um, you can never have too much power because even you know this thing looks like it can shoot the moons of Jupiter on a cloudy day, but on uh, you know in low lighting, if there was a bird perched just on the other side of this cafe, it would just kind of look like a grainy mess. So um, luck is a big part of it, and just knowing how to set your camera to the right environment conditions. It's a whole thing. So who's still there? Is what? Is the moose still there? Is the moose still there? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Unless another one's come up. Uh, yeah. I'll point one for you. Yeah. I sort of up past the uh, 23rd uh, of the No, from what I heard, it was um, like just north of Rainbow Valley Park, kind of hanging out in the southern end of what we call like the north section of the park. Um, yeah, the, the people I know who are there all the time have seen it around like early mid July. Um, but I also haven't really spent all that much time there in the past few weeks. So I don't know if anybody's seen it lately. Um, but that's the thing with young moose, they just kind of wander. Um, and especially with October coming up, they're going to be wandering all the more and just looking forward.
know what? Moments like that are always when I don't have my camera. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guarantee you might have seen something. I had my camera, but they were already gone. I got the camera. That happens. Well, it's preserved up here. Yeah. yeah. I know they're seeing raccoons in the River Valley. And I've just heard a couple stories. I was just up in Athabasca where all my family have trail cams, and they're seeing a lot up in Athabasca on their trail cams. I was surprised because I hadn't heard that we're seeing more here. They're just kind of flabbergasted. Yeah. A lot of raccoons and cougars. And these are people that have lived there a long time and are quite surprised by the number of times they've picked up both raccoons and cougars on their trail cam. Yeah, they're, they're around. I, I don't think raccoons in particular are, are feeling quite as confident out here as they are in places like Toronto. Um, but they're, they're moving northwest in, I think it was winter 2018, I documented um, raccoon prints in the snow just west of Grand Prairie, um, you know, which is not insignificantly to the northwest of us, so they're up there. Um, well, these, these, both these families live on the river on that fast river, that's what I was curious. Like, I know I've heard Catherine that I talked about it, but are we seeing increased activity or is there still just been a few sightings? Well, that's the question. Um, is it like people seeing like a small number of them over and over again, or are we seeing more and more individuals? I, I think it might be a bit of both cases, but it's not super up on the research. Tough one. I think Calgary already claimed the mayor and I. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe. I don't know what's going on. Maybe the. Okay, hear me out. Either the magpie or maybe the. Do I dare say the raven? Maybe the yes. raven is more raven. Yeah, but then you probably have like white horse flying the raven as well. But both of these species are, you know, they're, they're intelligent, they're tenacious, they're tough, they don't have really obvious adaptations for the winter, but they just stick it out all year anyway. Um, they are perfectly willing to, you know, fight one another for the smallest little bit of time. What could be more Edmontonian? Honestly. <laughs> it just, it's a matter of time until you see a magpie, you know, down a can of Lucky Lager and go back to the <laughs> And I say that with love as I'm going to tell you. Any other questions? Yes? There's, there's always a lot of trails coming into the woods that they aren't cold with you on. But you have to stay on the main trail. Or... Um, okay. Honestly, if you're on any trail, it, that's like fine. Um, you know, wildlife, they make their own trails. Like um, don't get me started on this thing, honestly. Um, but uh, yeah, honestly, as long as you're not like walking on the vegetation, um, you know, generally you're okay. As long as you're going somewhere that is going to be hazardous to you. And like, kind of the big reason is you walk through an area um, not on the trail, you're just kind of bushwhacking. There's all these little plants covering the ground that when you step on them, you're killing them. Uh, and you're stepping on things like uh, you know, insects metamorphosizing under the leaf litter, and like so you're kind of committing like little mini biological genocides every time you, you break trail. So uh, yeah, even if you're just walking on the dirt or whatever, like you know, that's that's generally fine. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh,